Hi there, everybody. Back again to the next session. I'm here to introduce you to Benjamin, and he knows everything about open source. So the stage is for you. Go ahead. He can't stand me up like that. I don't know everything about open ah, source. You do. <laughs> Right. Okay. With that kind Good of introduction, luck. I am bound to fail. No, I know. I know some things about open source, and I'm willing to admit that much only. Um, hello. Uh, so my name is Ben, and um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability. I haven't had a chance to run through this talk, so please do feel free uh, to tell me if I'm running over, Daniel. Um, but yeah, I'll keep a broad eye on the time. We're all good. Also, excuse me if I'm clicking a couple of times because I'm running some sort of gangster setup uh, between two different versions of the same presentation. We all love technology, especially uh, open source technology, which is why we're here. Right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm not gonna say too much at this moment because I'm gonna roll some of the stuff uh, into the presentation more generally. So I'm Ben, hello. And I work mainly on two things, which as I say, I'm gonna talk about uh, in my presentation. And today I'm gonna talk about open source sustainability. I wanna tell you a little bit about how you can get involved and give you a little food for thought about how to solve some of the problems that we have in this space. If I do tend to talk too quickly, uh, I'm really sorry. I have a tendency to speed up. Um, I'm gonna try and maintain an even pace, but I'm just generally excited to work in this space. Um, I've recently kind of re-entered it from working on a couple of other things. And when I get excited, I talk quickly. So uh, please bear with me. The only other thing I'm gonna say is I'm gonna try and make as little uh, kind of assumptions as possible about you as an audience member. Um, so please, if I'm covering things that you already know, then try not to switch off. I promise I'll get to something new um, within the 30 minutes that I've got for this talk. So, it's very difficult to talk about sustainability these days. Uh, and this is me getting on to the next slide. So, uh, it's very difficult to talk about sustainability these days. Um, the world has kind of woken up to sustainability in its various guises. Um, for me, this image kind of broadly encapsulates and quite gracefully kind of explains the problem that we have um, in open source right now. And it kind of gave us a great signal boost for work in this space. Um, in my opinion, kind of, you know that you're really mainstream in tech when you've got an XKCD comic out, right? Um, but what I want to do is just kind of briefly talk to about how we got to the situation in which all of our kind of modern, what we now call digital infrastructure has come to depend upon, you know, some random person working in their underpants in their spare time, because why not? It's hot. Um, so I'm just going to take us briefly through kind of the history and the timeline, um, and then we'll see where we get to. So for me, uh, this journey kind of started with Heartbleed. And Heartbleed, for me, really kind of woke the world up to this problem in general. So I think it's a, it's a good place to start. In 2014, uh, vulnerability in OpenSSL used in nearly 70% of the world's internet connected devices was, discover was discovered and documented. And the net result of it, I won't go into the detail, um, was that nearly everyone who was using OpenSSL, OpenSSL had to cycle their SSL certificates. It's the thing that gives you like the little padlock in the corner of your web browser. Um, and in order, uh, they had to do that in order to secure traffic to their sites. So the impact of that for like the individual level was relatively small, but across the whole world, the impact of that kind of commercially, financially is huge. Um, and at the time, because of my background, I have a, a master's degree in computer security and a specialism in cryptography, but I chose not to work in defense, which was the, the largest area that I could have worked in with those kinds of skills when I left academia. I instead chose to work in kind of web development and mobile application development. So I had a rather strange set of skills in which I could kind of talk to a very general tech audience and also to these people who were talking very, very kind of academic terms about mathematics and some of the causes of some of these problems. Um, and this group of people, we're broadly asking, you know, which other projects look like OpenSSL and what can we do to support them? So I left my job in a civic tech company building open source software, which was kind of almost incidental, but has kind of, as an Ouroboros serpent, kind of ended up eating its tail, which I'll get to later on. Um, and ever since then, I've kind of worked on this general problem space. So since 2015, uh, when I left my job, at uh, my society, which is a civic tech kind of company. Um, I've worked on a few projects uh, that are represented over in these logos. 
So my society on the left, I then started a project with a friend of mine and colleague, uh, Andrew, called libraries.io, uh, which was kind of a search engine for software, which is still up at libraries.io, and dependency CI, which was a project that was about uh, staying on top of your software dependencies, um, keeping abreast of things that are going on. And then more recently, I've been working on a third party application for GitHub notifications called Octobox, which is an open source application. You can find it at octobox.io. And I just, I say just maybe eight weeks ago, left GitHub, where I was also working on GitHub notifications and just broadly trying to work into this kind of area of open source sustainability and working to support maintainers um, within GitHub as well. Um, so that's a little bit about me, but we kind of started the journey with Heartbleed and I want to kind of take you through kind of the problem space and effectively where we're at um, and the kinds of conversations we've been having since 2015 and kind of where we're at with our understanding. And hopefully this will bring you up to a kind of level and we'll have a couple of points at which we can kind of talk through um, along the way with some guides and things that you might want to get involved in. So if I go through to my next slide. So one of the things that we broadly end up talking about uh, is common pool resources. Sorry, I meant to go to another slide, which has just skipped ahead of that. So what's the cause of the problem? Uh, it's generally, uh, in my opinion, a combination of two factors. Um, we have restriction-free licensing, which is great, and I'm not complaining about that. And then we have an ease of distribution enabled through packaging and dependency management. And again, don't get me wrong, both of these things are great for the world, but essentially we've created an environment for a class of products that are known in economics as public goods. So you can use them without limiting access to anybody else, and you can use them without exhausting them for other users. But importantly, we've also built a class of products with near perfect information asymmetry when it comes to usage. I don't know who's using my software, and very few of those users know who else within that group is using that piece of software as well. And this means it's very difficult to organize and govern the use of these goods. So if I step back and go to my piece on common pool resources, why do we need to govern the use of these goods? That's because open source software is not a public good. And there are two reasons for this. Um, firstly, open source software exists in a landscape that is constantly shifting. If you know anything about kind of uh, software evolution and complexity, then you might have heard of Lehman's laws of software evolution. Uh, open source software is generally an E-type uh, problem in which uh, programs are strongly linked to the environment in which it runs, which broadly just means that as projects need to adapt to the landscape that in which they run, they need maintenance. Um, and then secondly, secondly uh, people are needed to do that maintenance, right? To keep the project alive. Unfortunately, AI hasn't got to the degree where we can automate a lot of open source maintenance as much as projects like Dependabot would like to think you have, think they, that, that they can. Um, so it's in these people and the community at large in which uh, we kind of call like this, this resource um, that can be exhausted, which is why we're not calling it them public goods. And considering code, I think, separate from the people who maintain that code, it's a fundamentally flawed idea, in my opinion. I see many people doing that, both in terms of how they discuss the rights to code, um, uh, separate from the rights to the people that create that code. Um, I think broadly, I think like code is essentially a byproduct of the community that builds it. By which I would say um, that that is probably the, the primary uh, learning point in the entirety of my talk is just considering code separate from the community that creates it will lead you down a path of horrors. Um, but you could just fork a project, right? So the license says that you get to do whatever you want with a piece of open source software, including forking it and changing it and redistributing it, which means that actually the community behind a project might not be entirely valuable because you've always got access to the code, to which I say, no, um, it's true, yes, but again, we're in the situation where the cost to you as an individual may be small, but the cost across the entire user base can be immeasurably huge, which is predominantly down to another factor, which is the distribution channel, like package management and so on. Um, if the community has to switch to an alternative, the pathways to do so are not well documented, uh, they're not well supported, and that information asymmetry kind of hits us in the butt again. So then we start talking about another problem, which is broadly called 
if I skip to the correct slide, the tragedy of the commons. Um, so the tragedy of, of the commons is a characterization of an issue that occurs when we have a common pool resource, uh, which in our case is the people and the community behind an open source project, who are feeling the weight and the demands of a diffuse kind of distributed and increasingly expectant uh, user base. I think a lot of people in open source these days treat maintainers kind of as they would a commercial provider, which is just not really what they signed up for. Um, and broadly, I think a lot of maintainers of a certain type of project are done with that kind of arrangement. So I think what we have to do at this point is say that this characterization is not true for all open source projects. Uh, some don't have the kind of usership that places demands on maintainers. Um, so we might refer to them as kind of toys um, in which kind of the maintainer is just messing about themselves, kind of scratching their own itch. Some are niche enough that the state of development is such that nearly everyone in the community has an interest and participates in development of technology, which falls into two brackets, kind of clubs where you have a small group of people that are maybe building some automation software for telescopes or federations that are building huge, huge projects um, in which everyone is kind of participating on a collaborative kind of basis. And you kind of get some projects like Linux maybe, um, or that, that might be even a different class now. Um, that we kind of broadly call federations. And it's only in these projects where we have a small number of contributors and a high number of users that we, we see this kind of tragedy of the commons type issues. At which point, I think I have to thank Nadia Ekbal, who gave us a way to classify these projects. Um, and you should totally check out her book, which is called Working in Public, which will show you everything that you need to know about this problem and give you a lot more context about work in the open source community and how that kind of works. Um, far better than I can within, within a few minutes anyway. So uh, I would just sort of say thank you very much uh, to Nadia. Uh, I promise I'm not going to put a photo of you on a slide for very long, so we'll skip on through. <laughs> so very quickly, back to the tragedy of commons. Um, Thankfully, we've got a wealth of work in this space um, that comes from Nobel Prize winning economist called Eleanor Ostrom. And Eleanor's work uh, involved uh, a vast review of practices and policies concerning other common pool resources, things like forestries and fisheries and such like. And the work developed into a book called Governing the Commons, in which she set out a set of principles that need in place in order to successfully govern a common pool resource amongst a set of all of its users. Uh, at which point I'm going to put another photo of someone's big ass face <laughs> on a slide. Um, and I would just like to direct you to the work of a guy called Greg Bloom. This is Greg, uh, who's part of a small community that I'll talk about in a moment. And he's been reformulating the principles that Ellen Ostrom set out in Governing the Commons into a format that can be more readily applied to the open source ecosystem. And I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. But first, what I'm going to do is get Greg's face off the screen, otherwise he will kill me. Uh, and instead, you get to look at Eleanor Ostrom in her heyday, which is a beautiful photo. I'm sure we can all agree. Uh, anyway, so the principles uh, for governing the commons that Eleanor Ostrom set out say a lot of things. They say you should have clearly defined boundaries on who can use a resource. They say you should have appropriate rules for governing that use. You should have a process for deciding on those rules. You should have um, a, be able to monitor the usage. And those people should be accountable to appropriators of that resource, people who use that resource. You should have sanctions, and you should be able to enforce those sanctions. And you should be able to manage conflicts. And then it goes on to say you should have the right to self-govern and that you should accept that you're a part of a landscape that has a uh, kind of uh, layering to all of these self-governing communities and that you exist within a community of communities, which is all ideal for informing individual projects, policies on governance and a great kind of basis for which to set a set of not ground rules, but prompts to think about how an individual project should uh, govern itself, whether it comes to kind of contribution, whether it comes to potentially even usage. Um, but it makes a kind of massive assumption, which is that all of these projects uh, can kind of communicate with one another and that uh, they generally know what is going on elsewhere around them, which reminds me of this diagram. So fundamentally, they assume that it's possible to identify, communicate, and collaborate between projects as a community, um, which is where we have like another distinct set of problems in open source. Uh, so we understand generally like the cause of this problem. 
and I've only shared like one aspect of it so far. We understand parts of the solution of which governance again is only one, but we still kind of struggle to link uh, the two together in such a way that we can begin to solve issues in the space as a community, which is why we started one. Um, so we created a community to kind of just do just that, sustain, um, it's a collaboration between a few organizations working to understand, promote and collaborate towards solving problems uh, in the open source kind of ecosystem around sustainability. We hold annual gatherings in which we organize events, which are more akin to like workshops than conferences. Um, there are some talks, but it's more of a kind of round table kind of feel. And generally we just try to provide spaces and funding for groups to collaborate together in this space. We've been doing it since 2017. We have a podcast, um, we have a forum for people to share and participate in others' work. You can check out uh, everything on sustainoss.org, including Greg's work on uh, a more kind of accessible version of the principles of governing the commons and a load of other work besides that's going on in this area. Um, we're not the only community operating in this space either. Um, so I have to do a shout out to the Chaos Project, which is supported by the Linux Foundation. That's also doing a lot of work in this space. And we have a lot of kind of cross pollination between events and participants in both of those communities. Um, one of the outcomes uh, of the first sustain that we did back in San Francisco at GitHub headquarters in 2017 was a report that I authored, um, but it was very much a kind of collaborative effort between myself, a couple of other kind of reviewers and everyone that participated in that first event. And I won't go into it in too much detail, but that report, which you can find, uh, if actually I'll just do this, you can find it at that URL. Um, it report contained a few recommendations for members of the community at large. So anyone that's kind of working within or around open source software, which I think we can all understand as most of us at this point. Um, and that report contains a set of kind of recommendations, um, some of which that I want to pick up. So the first was kind of this concept of committing to the commit in which uh, we talk about seeing a contribution to an open source project, not as a gift, but kind of as like a millstone around a maintainer's neck. Um, that is, unless you commit to be there when the code that you contribute yourself needs maintenance, um, which is a very important point. Another point was that we kind of need to free the maintainers, um, which is a great soundbite, but what it means is that when considering um, the right choice of individuals involved in maintaining a project, um, that they get to choose when they want to engage with the user base and that they get to do so to do so on their own terms. We really need to kind of about face this, this view of open source software as an almost kind of commercial, commercially available piece of software in which you get support on demand and no matter how unreasonable those demands are, you um you can escalate and escalate and escalate. We need to kind of free maintainers from that because they're doing work predominantly in their own time and they should get to say when they engage. And then finally, um, optimizing projects for governance and retention and raising the value of non-code contributions, which is I think one of my more important points, particularly for this community. Uh, it talks generally about um, a huge kind of part of achieving uh, sustainability and resilience in general in open source software is um, to have a varied set of skills and a varied set of people involved in open source. And I'm just very conscious of the fact that I'm talking, I assume, to a group of people who have a skew towards the kind of marketing uh, kind of side of things and PR, which are just hugely needed in open source right now. We need more people like you in open source and we need members of this community specifically um, to, to get involved and Reciprocally, the community needs to make you feel welcome as well. And that's a big part of what we're talking about with this. Um, we're doing this with the design community for efforts like open source design. Um, but yeah, open source generally needs a more diverse set of skills and experiences to become sustainable. Um, which is where we actually started talking about sustainability, right? So what is this, 19 minutes into a presentation about sustainability and I'm finally talking about sustainability. I really should get on with things. Um, but yeah, I think Broadly, when I'm thinking about uh, sustainability, I'm predominantly thinking about resilience, 
Um, so the ability to kind of weather the storm, adapt to changes in a project's resources and, and balance incentives from an incentive design is, is a big thing, especially when it comes to some of the other factors, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so just generally, we need a more diverse set of people in open source with regards to their skills, their geography and their experience. And crucially, we need a diverse set of revenues that support that community, at which point some people go like this. Um, which is all well and good and easy to do if, for instance, you've got enough money to privately fund the Le Mans race team. Um, but that's kind of almost entirely the problem. I know because I used to run a project that was a huge database of most of open source software, including all of the different links between projects and individuals and contributors and so on. And I know for a fact that open source is predominantly the domain of the, the privileged and open source has enabled the generation, including myself, uh, to practice a craft, to build a network and a portfolio, which has made them increasingly wealthy. Um, and we should own that. And we should be working towards solutions in this space because like it or not, money is an incentive that works in a wide range of contexts. It works in contexts in which the more implicit motivations to contribute to open source, so building a portfolio, making contacts, building a network, learning, practicing, um, don't always exist in open source, uh, especially in the more mature kind of side of projects um, that are no longer cool, like maintaining curl, maybe not as cool as you might think, um, massively important, I'm sure, to the world's technology. Um, projects needs kind of routine maintenance. And I think it is fair to say that money as an incentive to do that kind of work is an acceptable incentive. Um, there are some issues with it. Um, we've got to balance those incentives, but we'll get to that. Um, but you know, just generally, like people need to be able to pay for their time in order to be able to contribute often because they need a roof over their heads and food. Um, so thankfully, we have an increasingly wide number of ways in which projects can financially support themselves. Back when Heartbleed was kicking off, so 2014, we had a few larger institutions supporting projects in their domains, so the Linux Foundation, the Apache Foundation, those kinds of organizations. And we had a few people kind of playing around at the edges of what it meant to sponsor someone working in open source. I think it was uh, maybe Evan Yu and a couple of others who were working on Patreon, uh, who were broadly just ignoring everything that was going on on their platform. Um, and I had to once again kind of thanks Nadia, I'm not going to put the photo up, um, for her early work on what was called the Lemonade Stand project. And that like Ostrom, uh, she kind of reviewed all the ways in which projects at the time were supporting their work financially through events and advertising and support agreements, dual licensing and, and other things that you can do. Um, and you can check that out. There's a link just at the bottom of that page just there. I will make sure that all these links come out with the presentation as well. Um, I've used some of these methods to reasonable effect. I'm not going to say hugely successful because you know it's all measurable. It's, it's all um, comparative. comparative. Um, but with a project that I run called Octobox, which is an open source project that sells access to private repositories through a commercial company, which is wholly owned by the maintainers, me and Andrew, um, with a public commitment to provide at least 15% of our revenues back to the community for development. Um, and today, I think we just broadly can accept the Investing in open source uh, is recognized as a need. Um, and I see that rec reflected in the growth of kind of open source program offices and in industry and projects like GitHub sponsors, which has really kind of amped the amount of money that's coming into the space. Um, and I see like there's still a few problems um, in the space. I mean, basic, uh, it's really so. The organizations that I work for, sorry, I'm just going to skip back. So the organizations that I work for, uh, so this Open Collective and Open Source Collective, are kind of here for that growth in the space. Uh, so we provide a platform on which communities can manage funds openly and transparently. And an organization, Open Source Collective, that provides access to the, the legal and financial system for open source projects. And Mautic is, of course, just one of the 2,800 plus projects that we support in this way. And we're working just generally to kind of grow the space, to develop new ways to support open source software financially and to support projects to use money as an incentive to drive development in a project um, in a way that kind of maintains independence and, and manages um, incentives across each of those kind of financial contributions. But getting back to it, I kind of see a fundamental issue with many of the solutions that are on offer today. And again, it's down to that kind of information asymmetry. So I'm going to crash through some of my kind of key messages here. Um, the first is uh, that 
In my opinion, a lot of the solutions that address the problem of financial support for open source software behave a lot like competitive marketplaces. Um, we see like the mark marketable projects with the exposure and the story leaders, and in many cases, um, the original kind of successes um, are increasingly becoming the winners in the marketplaces that we're building. And marketplace based solutions are great for funding future investments for supporting projects in which we see potential for future, but we've not really realized it yet, but they don't solve the problem of funding the unseen infrastructure that lies below the waterline. Um, and basically my opinion is, is that we need to kind of fund the projects that we use as well as the projects that we see. I mean, kind of remember where we're coming from, the situation where we've got, you know, the projects that we don't see very easily uh, and yet they're holding up all of uh, what we now call kind of digital infrastructure. The next is like furthermore, basically um, the opportunities that do exist to financially support a project are not equally distributed. So for example, with Octobox, project I maintain, um, we own the de facto URL for a domain and we can provide an income for ourselves and our community. But what about the projects that don't have those same opportunities, the databases that we use, the ORMs that we use in order to integrate with those databases, even maybe like the syntax highlighters that we use when we're working every day, kind of developing. And I think in part, what we need to do is support all of open source software. And we need to kind of come together and build the connections that enable those with the opportunities to generate revenue, track support, and otherwise bring money into the system to support those that don't. We effectively have like a situation where we have a huge kind of uh, sphere of open source with a kind of upper atmosphere of proprietary software and the organizations that that sell that software using that kind of commons in the middle. And we have like these edge nodes that exist on the edge of the planet, if I'm not mixing my metaphors too much, that need to kind of support those in the core. And it's gonna be a long journey, um, but as a starting point, my recommendation is that those communities who are able to begin to support, um, uh, so those communities that exist on the edge are able to support the communities that they rely on specifically whether that's through contributions. And again, you know, if you're a marketing professional, consider yourself incredibly valuable in this context or through direct financial support. And we need to start thinking just generally less like islands in which we're looking after our own kind of project and our own community and maybe a bit more like archipelagos. Um, and we need to kind of think as communities kind of drilling down into the projects that we support as well, that support us as well. Um, so that's pretty much my broad message. I think I am broadly on time. Um, thank you for spending a bit of time with me. I think we have maybe 15, 20 minutes scheduled for Q&A. Uh, I'm very happy to kind of talk just generally about my work across a bunch of different things that I've been doing. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks a lot, Ben. Was uh, very... Uh... Inspirating. Um, yeah, I, I saw a lot of names in all your slides and initiatives. Uh, yeah, it's a bit, uh, it's a big, a bit big for me. Uh, how, how do I need to understand all these different uh, companies, initiatives? Uh, uh, for example, uh, I saw I was I was googling uh, Matic and how they are funded, right? And uh, I find them on Fund OS, but it's connected to Open Collective. How does this all work? Yeah, I mean, it's number one, it's great to be where we are now because I remember in 2015, there was a room of about 15 to 30 people that were working in this space. And it, you know, it, over the course of the, the next year or two, it grew to the point where just about kind of know everyone in the space and now it's just huge. Um, so it is great to be in the situation where you're like able to share a lot of names and companies and, and different people that are working in the area. Um, generally, what I will try and do is share all these resources. So if you follow me on Twitter, um, I will post some of the resources up. But first of all, I would recommend reading Nadia's book, uh, Working in Public. I've got a copy here. Uh, it has the distinct advantage of being beautiful on your shelf. Um, and then I'll post another couple of references as well. Uh, with regard to Open Source Collective and Open Collective, there is understandably a little bit of confusion. Um, so Open Collective is a platform and that platform is relatively opinionated when it comes to two things. Number one, 
the openness and transparency is the default um, and Acto thing that we like to support. Um, so we kind of build a platform for you to use money in a community openly and with all the transparency that you would like. Um, and then Open Source Collective basically uses that platform with a structure to support open source projects. So we kind of extend our legal status and our kind of financial status and do all the necessary accounting and tax filing and so on to enable open source projects to run their finances uh, on the Open Collective platform. So about 2,800 projects that we support like that, um, as well as Maltic. And then just very generally across those organizations, the kind of Open Collective family, plus other organizations like Gitcoin, we do various projects that are just trying to kind of uh, broaden the understanding and appreciation of that space and raise more funds for it. So Fund OSS, which I think you've probably heard a little bit about throughout this event, um, is one of those campaigns. We are almost exactly halfway through it. Just uh, we've got one more week uh, funding that we are driving towards a match fund campaign. And the idea there is to try to bridge between um, this, these two groups of people that kind of exist in the world, the, the kind of people that can write $100,000 checks and the kind of people who develop open source software or use open source software and have all of that knowledge. So what we're trying to do is through our own connections and through connections of people in the space, kind of raise a match fund from those organizations um, that are willing to kind of commit the funds, but for whatever reason, don't have the necessary knowledge to be able to be, like direct them to the right places. And then, distribute it to projects that are kind of democratically uh, voted on by uh, members of the public um, through a process that we're calling democratic voting, because regardless of how much you actually give during the campaign, each of those kind of donations is treated as a signal. Um, so yeah, we're trying to kind of bridge this, this uh, other information asymmetry and divide knowledge between uh, these two groups of people. So. Thanks. Yeah, it's good to good to know that there's a there's a collective of collectives and uh, there's a, a focal point on uh, on Fund OS to get to the global pu public. And um, I was interesting. What 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 can can we do? We uh, we are a freelancer. We have an employer. Um, yeah. So we just sign up ourselves as individuals or try to back something. Uh, what should we back? Uh, should we ask our employers to, to do something or? I would say like all of the above. Um, my message just generally isn't here to say, hey, you know, Fund OSS is a thing and everyone should go and pile into that. I think the maybe more important message is that open source needs more people uh, with a broader and more diverse set of skills. And you're representing that set of skills and those people. Um, so get involved in projects that you either use or you're aware of, or that are within the kind of Maltic community um, and in the dependency stack. Um, if you can give any money towards those projects, then find any opportunity that you can do, including Fund OSS, including GitHub sponsors, including all the other things that are going on in the world. Um, I get to be very happy in that I do not genuinely care how you support open source software. What we're trying to do is provide a platform for projects that want to manage that money, regardless of where it's from, in a way and in a space that is transparent and is kind of supporting the growth of that community so they can govern it and they can use that money effectively. So yeah, I mean, number one, get involved. Number two, as the community, kind of consider your dependencies and the, the software that you depend upon and build upon as well, because the opportunities to kind of raise support and awareness for the needs of those projects is not is not equally distributed. Maltics of the world are in quite a unique position relative to all of those kind of pieces of software that exist underneath that waterline. Yeah, so how do you go at, at that? Because all the, this, this dependency tree is it, it's huge, right? And the Maltic yeah. and the Drupal, and then they're, they're big communities that have a lot of exposure. But so they're again, all, there are, there are now, on. yeah, so happily there are now multiple ways in which you can do that. So GitHub has support um, for dependency analysis. There are various other products and services that you can use to dependency analysis. Libraries.io, if you're an open source project, is a very easy way to check which kind of dependencies you rely on. And then there are a couple of projects that have kicked off recently that 
are specifically for supporting open source dependencies and being able to give on mass to all your dependencies. So Flossbank is one of them. Fair OSS is a kind of related project as well. And Libra Celery is another project that is worth checking out. So yeah, we have experimented in that space in the past with a project called Back Your Stack. Um, and I might want to revive it at some point in the future. But honestly, we're kind of taking a moment to kind of look again at where Open Source Collective is in the universe and where that organization needs to be to complement everything else that's happening in the space. I only just started as executive director about three months ago. Um, and we're kind of five years in uh, to that particular organization. So we're having a moment of the world has changed. Where do we need to be? Are you aware of any projects that are sharing their donations with uh, with their dependencies, for example? Yeah, um, Octobox is one of them. I just gave like ten thousand dollars <laughs> um, because Octobox has been running on kind of auto mode for a little while, and we kind of have a uh, number of sponsors and supporters um, plus the commercial company that's been kind of pouring money into a pot for community development. And we haven't had the time to do some of that development. So we thought the best thing to do was to basically support the software that supports us because that's effectively free development. Um, so yeah, we gave $10,000 uh, to Flossbank to all of our dependencies. And we're kind of calling on any of those projects to get in touch with the guys at Flossbank and, and be able to kind of grab that support. Um, I think if you're a core Ruby maintainer, there's a couple of thousand dollars waiting for you there. So just give them a shout. Um, but yeah, very broadly, we were doing that because we want to kind of send this message that we think other organizations should be doing that, commercial and otherwise. Um, yeah. It's a quite unique situation, right? That you have another yeah. sponsorship that you can afford to give to uh, other projects. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's an important thing, right? Like, I think it, we're a little bit ahead of it right now, but if things keep going in the direction that they are, I hope that we will end up being in a position where some open source projects that are kind of representative of that edge node, where they've got the opportunity to raise a significant amount of money, will be able to give back to the software that they depend upon that, that don't have the necessary kind of opportunities, the exposure, or maybe even just like those kind of enigmatic leaders that put themselves out there in the world. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of trying to look ahead to that situation and, and encourage people to consider that when the time comes as well. Nice. So maybe um, there are no more, no, no more questions in the chat. So maybe you, we can conclude with maybe some um, some extra ex examples of communities that uh, do really great. Maybe not even from the from the <laughs> funding perspective, but also from uh, an organizational perspective and getting people involved. Do, do you have some nice examples where we can learn from some multi community? Yeah, I think, you know, the Malta community is not doing a bad job. Listening to the sessions yesterday, like, I think Ruth is doing a great job and following a lot of the kind of best practice when it comes to creating a welcoming atmosphere for people in a project. And a very human kind of aspect of that is just being there and being supportive. Um, I think Homebrew do a great job at managing what is effectively the de facto package manager for Mac OS. Um, and that is a huge community. Um, they're supported by Software Freedom Conservancy, and I know some of the maintainers of that, that project. Um, so I would look to them. I know that Drupal do a great, great job also, um, Joomla, and yeah, a couple of other projects, but it, it's kind of context sensitive. Um, it's what's appropriate for the community and the scale and the type of project as well. Um, yeah, I think there's there, there are lots of examples uh, happily where I can point that out. I will also give a shout out to Henry at Babel, who's been doing a really good job and has been kind of working in public to, to coin, use kind of Nadia's phrase, um, and sharing his learning when it comes to how they've been managing their time and the amount of money that they're paying themselves for that time to work on Babel. Um, there's been a couple of discussions recently, and I think they've kind of weathered a bit of a storm that personally I don't think needed to happen. Um, because I think, you know, the issue is what what is the value of someone's time and also what is maintenance? And I think that those are questions that are really important um, to kind of discuss and answer. It isn't necessarily true that maintenance of an open source project is just developing code. Like you can use bounties for that. 
Um, maybe maintenance is making sure that there is a generation of developers who understand the kind of constituent components of the problems that are trying to be solved by that particular package. Maybe maintenance isn't even uh, looking after that particular package and the kind of future of it. Maybe it's just broadly trying to build an appreciation of that domain because we need more developers in that domain working on those problems. And that's that's maintenance in that context. Thanks. Well, let's wrap up and uh, give a shout out to uh, to all the contributors out there and people who help fund stuff. And uh, we have also a community room here in the in the conference. So if you want to talk more about it, you will probably find enough like-minded people there to help you and discuss other topics. Hey, thanks, Ben, and uh, see cool. you around. Thank you.